Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Twimmelfest. I hope you are really enjoying this amazing virtual AI conference that we've put together for you. Uh, we will jump into today's keynote interview shortly, but I'd like to share a few uh, updates and announcements with you. Uh, first off, the coded bias screening and discussion is happening. Uh, the screening has started already. If you have indicated your interest in participating in the screening with us, uh, you will have been mailed a link to the screener. Uh, of course, we will be watching the screener together on Saturday. Uh, if you'd like to join us for that, followed by a conversation with uh, the director and several of the folks who have been featured in the film. So I encourage you, uh, if you've not already expressed interest in that, uh, uh, visit the agenda and click interested or going for Saturday's session and you will immediately get the email about the screener. Uh, we've got a ton more great sessions lined up for you uh, this week. We've got uh, a session on data logging tomorrow, a session on AI and ML and physics tomorrow, a conversation about AI and the fight against climate change tomorrow, and then we've got a bunch of amazing uh, sessions happening next week as well. So I encourage you to once again visit the agenda and check out all of those sessions. We've added a bunch. Uh, so if you haven't been there recently, you definitely want to go there and catch up. And of course, on Tuesday, I'm super excited to have an interview with Sal Khan, the founder of Khan Academy. And we'll be talking about the future of uh, online education education generally, and of course, machine learning and AI education, as well as community building. So it will be a, a really amazing conversation. Um, so a little bit about today's interview. Uh, this interview is going to be a little bit different from some of the others that you've seen as part of Twimmelfest. I had an opportunity to interview Milan Tambe, who is the uh, head of AI for Good with Google India um, <clears throat> not too long ago. And in fact, it was just before in the in the run up to Twimmelfest. And we thought, wow, this was such a great interview. We need to include it in Twimmelfest. It's right in line with the topic of uh, community and social good that we have been uh, really trying to elevate in this event. Uh, and so the session you're about to see is pre-recorded, um, but Milland is with us uh, in our virtual distributed studio. Uh, we will both be available to address your questions that are submitted via the chat, and we will both be coming back on screen for live Q&A immediately after uh, we watch the interview together. Uh, so on that note, uh, I'd like to get that uh, interview going. All right, everyone, I am here with Milan Tambe. Milan is professor of computer science and director of the Center for Research and Computation and Society at Harvard University, as well as a director uh, of AI for social good at Google Research India. Milan, welcome to the Tromo AI podcast. Thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I am very pleased to have you on the show and looking forward to learning a lot more about your work. Um, before we dive into that, yeah, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your background and how you came to work at this intersection of AI and social good. Um, so I have been working in AI for the past, uh, you know, if I count my PhD days, uh, 35 years, it's unbelievable uh, that it's been this long now. Wow. And, uh, you, know, I gra you know, after getting my PhD, focusing on this area of AI called agents and multi-agent systems, where essentially it's an idea of multiple agents interacting with each other and modeling social interactions of this type. Uh, about 15 years ago or so, I um, started focusing on problems related to 
direct social impact. And I realized that this is something that gives me great joy. It also is, is not only something where I can see direct impact, but also allows me to advance AI research in interesting ways. So uh, I'll give a very concrete example uh, as a motivating example, uh, but work has expanded since then. I grew up in the city of Mumbai in India, and uh, you know the shadow of 9/11 around 2005 was very large. You know, the, we were all shocked at that point, and there were attacks uh, in in Mumbai, including on a train uh, where there were some terrorist bombings. Where my mother was actually in the train. And these sorts of events, um, I mean, she was safe, she got down, not, nothing happened to her. But these sorts of events led me to sort of think about how can we contribute towards uh, public safety. And so one of the, at that point, the LA airport was uh, had approached us to say, can we improve placement of checkpoints and canine patrols and so forth. So this is, you know, my, now you can imagine 15 years ago. And so at that point, he said, well, we can apply game theory as a way of randomizing checkpoints and patrols and so forth uh, with the LA airport police. And uh, that ability to show that we can actually use AI directly in the real world uh, led, led me to realize that it feeds very interesting and new research problems that people hadn't thought of simultaneously allowing us to see direct impact in the field. And the work is now expanded from public safety more into wildlife conservation, uh, public health, working with uh, uh, social work and domains of that type. Mm -hmm. and, and in our pre-conversation, you made this really interesting this really interesting comment that I I'd love for you to recap um, about the relationship between the application of AI in a, a setting like social impact and, and social good and kind of fundamental innovation uh, in machine learning. You know, what, tell us a little bit about how you think about the relationship between those. So in my view, it is possible to have this work going on in social impact, which while simultaneously advancing AI research, they're not only not opposites, uh, but on the other hand, these social impact problems seem to fuel new kinds of AI research that doesn't traditionally uh, come up. A concrete example is um, when we talk about big data, I mean, since around 2008 or nine, you know, in the computer science department, there's sort of the sense that there's big data, big data. And when I'm working with these domains involving social impact, uh, often we, are str we struggle with data. There's not that data available. And so the innovation then is how do you work uh, in these domains when there is limited data, what kind of data to collect? And that's part of the AI research challenge that we struggle with. And this is where uh, we can't take standard techniques that are available in the literature from the papers and directly apply because the data is just not there, the data is noisy, all sorts of things where we have to take a, a different perspective on the problem. And, and you mentioned in describing the project with the uh, LA airports, uh, a, a theme that you mentioned in our pre-conversation as well, and that is that the application of uh, AI to these kinds of problems is often um, you know, interdisciplinary in the sense that you're pulling in techniques from like game theory and other places. I guess it seems obvious that applying AI to social impact would be interdisciplinary, uh, more so than, you know, applying it in a vacuum, duh. But, you know, tell us a little bit more about, you know, the way some of these things come into play. No, this is a, absolutely a wonderful uh, observation. This work is fundamentally interdisciplinary. We are working with uh, conservation scientists. We'll be working with uh, social workers on the ground. Um, so in all of these cases, there's so much to learn. Uh, our work has fundamentally been with nonprofits around the world, uh, whether it's homeless uh, youth shelters in Los Angeles or public health organizations in India or wildlife conservation organizations like WWF, WCS, and so forth. We view our work as really uh, understanding the challenges that they face on the ground 
and then enabling a better use of their limited resources to accomplish the goals that they have. And so this is a, a, a partnership whereby we are not, you know, coming in saying we as computer scientists already know what the solution technique ought to be. And we are going to come to you and tell you that this is the solution you should apply. Uh, but we want to first, so we are not married to the tool. We are, we, we are starting, from, we're going to start from the problem and then build up the solution technique. And so going to the point, you know, that we were discussing earlier about new problems coming up this way, with respect to the challenge we worked on, uh, the home youth experiencing homelessness, uh, this problem was brought to us by our colleagues in social work, uh, you know, that, that were, and so this is kind of a, this in, going back to the theme of interdisciplinary collaboration, Mm -hmm. It's them that brought the challenge to us saying, look, you know, this is a problem where we have to spread information about HIV prevention amongst these homeless youth. So and, let me take a step back and have you yeah, describe yeah. this project and uh, what the aims were in, in a little bit more detail. So the problem is, you know, there are 6,000 youth who sleep on the streets in a city like Los Angeles every night. Uh, it's a shame, but that is the truth. And so these are youth between age of, let's say, 13 to 24, something like that. And the rates of HIV in this population are known to be 10 times the rates of normal housed population. And the question then is, how do we spread information about HIV amongst this population to reduce HIV risk behaviors? And so the way the drop-in centers uh, do this work is that they will bring in peer leaders, key people who are maybe highly popular in the population, because you cannot go and talk to every one of those 6,000 youth. So you bring in key people, you talk to them about HIV risk behaviors, HIV testing, things of that nature, and hope that by word of mouth, the information will spread. So they'll talk to their friends, their friends will talk to their friends, and information will spread in this fashion. The question for us is, can we, can we have this be done in a more effective fashion than what they have done, which was to bring in the most popular youth? And so the AI challenge here is, given a social network of these youth, can we figure out who are the key nodes in the network who, if we seed uh, them with information, will spread the information in the most, uh, you know, in the broadest possible fashion. This is somewhat like viral marketing uh, that we are very familiar with, except that we are now trying to use it for spreading information about HIV and getting people to do HIV testing and reduce uh, HIV risk behaviors like uh, condomless sex and things of that kind. And the, okay, so we, we took on this challenge. So how do you identify key nodes who we will bring in. These are youth who we will bring in uh, instead of what the te whatever techniques they were using. We are going to identify these youth in a different way using our AI algorithms, using the social network structure. We're not going to use any private information, just what the network looks like. So what were they doing before? So they would just say, okay, who's the most popular youth in the words of, uh, in terms of social networks, these high degree nodes, you know, the nodes that have the most numbers of edges. Uh, who, uh, so, so that I mean, it makes sense. Except but based that on some some data set, or just asking people in interviews, you know, who's the most popular person you know, or something. Like that. And that's right. And and they have a sense of you know a, a youth who's like the most pop, you know, who are the most popular youth uh, in yeah. the drop-in center. And for us, the question is: Is there a better set? Because it makes total sense, right? That you would bring in the most popular people. If you talk to them, then they're going to spread the information in the widest possible fashion in the network. Uh, so the question for us is, could we do better than that yeah. by doing something more clever with the social network? And so we started uh, our algorithm, and I'll come to uh, an interesting twist. But the main point here is that the algorithm was able to identify different youth than the ones that they have ident they identified because it was looking for some strategic placement of those youth in the network because this is sub there are sub communities people who play basketball 
together, people who may be hanging out on the Venice beach together. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to see different communities in a very uh, strategic fashion rather than just, you know, you speak. there's no point in covering the same uh, parts of the network over and over again. You've got to go to the far reaches of the far corners of the network and send the information there. And so our algorithm was able to pick out these no, uh, nodes, these youth who were in these very strategic places in the network so that they could reach out to these communities that were not part of the sort of the main uh, community. And so we, you know, we built this algorithm. Uh, we have tested this with initially with pilot tests and showed that it performed better. You know, our algorithm led to higher HIV testing. And more recently have completed a test with uh, 800 youth experiencing homelessness and showed that with our algorithm, there is a significant reduction in HIV risk behaviors like uh, condomless anal sex and so forth. Whereas the traditional approaches, i.e. bringing in the most popular youth, the high degree nodes, that did not lead to such significant reduction. So this is statistically now something that we are able to show. Now, let me come to the twist, going back to the question we had discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. So traditional computer science uh, literature in this topic starts with the assumption that the social network is given. If you are doing viral marketing via Facebook or something, makes sense, you know, you have the social network yeah. and you work with it, makes sense. Here, we are working with this group of uh, youth there's no they're not they're not on facebook this is uh, you know the network is not available to us mm -hmm. so now the the interesting problem becomes you don't have the network but still you have to identify the key influencers in the network and so that means you have to do some interesting sampling of the network in order to figure out who should be key influencers so this is the point i was saying that these social impact problems are often in situations where there are vulnerable communities or marginalized populations where there's just not that kind of data available. And so then that leads to some interesting twists uh, on research problems or some fundamentally new research problems that traditional uh, you know, research threads have not pulled on because it's just not something that comes up uh, in, in those areas. Does that make sense? It does. And in this case, specifically, uh, one of those problems was around this sampling approach. Correct. So, how do you how do you uh, figure out what the social network may look like? Because you could go ahead and ask every single individual in the community who your friends are and build a network. But that's very costly, very expensive. Mm -hmm. So, could we just ask a sample? Let's say ten percent of the population, fifteen percent of the population. So, you only ask this question of who are your friends. To the you know 15% of youth instead of all of the youth. And then based on just that small sample, uh, you say, okay, what, what might the social network in this community look like? And based on that, automatic, you know, figure out who are the key influencers in this community. Mm. It strikes me that that approach would be, you know, maybe good at kind of constructing the known part of the social network that you referenced earlier, but maybe less good at finding you know, the the unknown or lesser known parts of the social network, like you mentioned, the you know, maybe the basketball network is strong and highly interconnected, but there's the beach, you know, part of the network that's less connected. Is that, that's not the case, though? No, it, it performs really well. And, uh, you know, in comparison of uh, the algorithm, when the, you know, we could kind of study the algorithm by doing tests where, okay, we know the full network versus... We don't, we don't know the full network and we compared the performance and we showed that the sampling actually does really well. Uh, so there's, you know, it's able to pick up enough of the network because it doesn't need to reproduce the network. All it needs to do is to figure out who are the key influencers. So as long as mm. based on the sample, it's able to identify that we are in good shape. Um, but there are many other challenges that came up that, uh, you know, we had not anticipated before. And it was important uh, that we actually do the test in the real world when, uh, you know, wh whereas um, if you if you hadn't, if we didn't do the test, we, if we hadn't gone to the field and tried this algorithm out, we wouldn't have figured this out. So this lack of social network is number one. 
Another is that normally when we think about this uh, social uh, influence and so forth, we assume that you bring in the seeds or you, you know, pick the influencers and the influencers will do their job because, you know, they are you know, viral marketing or what have you. <laughs> uh, but the problem here is that these are youth under difficult circumstances. And so we try to uh, invite them in. But, you know, they may not be able, I mean, they may not be able to afford the bus fare to come to the drop-in center, for example. Mm -hmm. So we may end up with a different group of people than the one we invited. Mm -hmm. And so you got to take into account these kinds of contingencies that normally wouldn't come up uh, in a, you know, a domain where these uh, community, you know, you don't have these kinds of um, vulnerable communities. So that's just to give you that, you know, being, I mean, going back to the original point we were discussing, which is, uh, you know, doing work with social impact uh, leads to these very interesting new research challenges that we wouldn't have imagined going into the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and going back to that specific example, the approach that you identified in that research direction, is that something... Where does that end up landing in the, you know, and maybe this is just a, 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 an academic semantics thing, but, you know, is that a social science research? Is that statistics research? Is that machine learning research? Does it even matter? <laughs> <laughs> no, those are, those are really fantastic questions. And on the one hand, as computer scientists, you know, we have to publish in our discipline, we have to make our mark in our discipline by showing that we're advancing the state of the art. So this is, uh, you know, this is definitely AI research. It's not pure machine learning, but it is definitely it's it's in this area of agents and multi-agent systems, which I referred to earlier, which is my home community. Essentially, it's trying to try and understand the interactions of multiple agents. Hold it all the way back to your home. Uh... Home that's right. That's right. That's right. So it's always so we can always show that we are making contributions there, and and certainly there's a role for machine learning and so on. But you are absolutely right. Then there's this interdisciplinary piece because then we can publish in social work uh, journals, uh, which is the work where you know you show the real impact that's going on. Mm -hmm. And then there's the piece in between, uh, which is very fascinating because there are some things that fall through the cracks. Uh, example is that. Um, how does information actually spread in a social network? Mm. Computer scientists build models saying information spreads by, for example, independent cascades. So, you know, I talk to you, you talk to somebody else, and information spreads in a cascade. Social uh, work research just says, well, there's a network effect, but they don't necessarily build this model, kind of a detailed model of how information will spread. Computer scientists wouldn't go into the field and test the model because that's not their, you know, that's not their job. <laughs> and social workers don't want to build the detailed model because that's not their discipline. And so exactly how does information spread in a social network? You know, is it this independent cascade model? Is it some other model? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like nobody i mean no it's 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 outside scope for both communities and these are open problems that uh fall through the cracks i think these are the kinds of problems that we want to get at and then we want to create places where we can publish this type of work and you're exactly right that there's some kind of you know interdisciplinary space where where we need to focus our attention on mm -hmm. to get get you know it, it is science <laughs> but it doesn't quite fall into any of the existing, uh, you know, disciplines. Uh, yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. You were also mentioning some work that you were doing in wildlife conservation. That is a, a topic that comes up. Uh, I wouldn't. I guess frequently is not the right word, but we do touch on it uh, from time to time on the podcast and some of our most. Uh, popular shows have been related to uh, wildlife conservation. What, how are you working in that area? So, as you know, uh, poaching is a massive problem around the world. Um, you know, the species are being decimated, and so the question then is: in ma in par national parks around the world, where we have small numbers of rangers, limited resources. 
and these vast areas to protect, can we give tools to the rangers to make their work, you know, easier mm-hmm. and make the, uh, you know, allow them to be more effective in their job? And so one of the ways is based on past poaching incidents that they report, can we predict where future poaching incidents may occur? Specifically, poachers kill wildlife or maim wildlife, uh, you know, by putting traps. And it's just horrible to think about it. In my lecture one time, I had like this, uh, you know, elephant that was trapped using this, uh, you know, snare. And it's just like the lady in one of the, you know, in the audience started crying. So then I felt like, okay, this is, this is, you know, too much for people to bear. And it is. And so anyhow, the point is, can we predict in advance who, uh, you know, where these traps may be set? So you could imagine thousands and thousands of square kilometers of land to pro- protect. And the range, uh, the poachers are setting up traps in a few of these places not everywhere around in the whole park. So if we can predict in advance that, you know, if you go to this area, you're going to find traps, uh, then that helps the rangers. Mm-hmm. The second thing we can do again is uh, improve the patrolling strategy uh, to make recommendations on patrols so as to make them more effective. But the first part, which is the prediction part, is um, you know is something that we have actually deployed in the real world uh, with the help of our partners uh, with World Wildlife Fund, Wildlife Conservation Society, Panthera, and other nonprofits, and shown that uh, you know it leads to a significant increase in the number of traps that they're able to capture. Mm-hmm. And did you observe similar, you know, types of things to the dynamics we were discussing earlier in terms of? Uh, the interdisciplinary nature or the, you know, where innovation is happening and uh, tackling these kinds of problems? Uh, Yes, absolutely. And I mean, this wildlife conservation domain, I uh, just as a side comment, it has allowed me to travel to uh, places that I normally wouldn't go to as a tourist. And so it's a a great excuse to go go to play different places like uh, to Uganda and Bangladesh and Malaysia and uh, wonderful places in national parks. So mm-hmm. it's the same uh, same types of things come up. For example, the rangers, um, you know, they go to, you know, they are searching through the park for these snares and uh, traps. And so they will report, you know, they go to a certain area and they say, well, we didn't find anything here. But when they say they found something, yes, they found something. But when they say we didn't find anything, it could just be that the trap was right there. That you know they just didn't see it because it might be a little well hidden. Or had they walked just a little bit more, they could have found it. The data is very sparse because you know uh, this is victimless crime. Well, it's a si- not it's a silent victim uh, a phenomenon in the sense that the animals are not calling back and saying you know that whatever you know so basically we have this uh, uh, problem that um, we have biased data you only get data on poaching incidents where patrols have happened you don't get data on anything else so there's all these kind of uh, stra- you know interesting phenomena in the data uh, that we have to address in terms of uh, so making these predictions again you know going back to the point of you know, these are these are uh, problems that are new and interesting. And the other problem then that comes up, going back to the topic of game theory, is that we are then trying to recommend patrols to the rangers. Mm-hmm. And the way uh, we want to do this is to say, you know, if we've uh, if we patrol in one place, the poachers are very clever, and they will realize that you're you know you're going to be here. Again, tomorrow, we've been patrolling this place. So they're clever. They'll go somewhere else. So you got to anticipate where they will go and uh, sort of play this, you know, play one move ahead of them or something like that. So that's mm-hmm. that's where the game theory starts to come in. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the other things that you've done kind of in this, this broad domain? So in recent work uh, that we have been doing as part of uh, the work we've done in Google Research India, we've been looking at um, adherence. Um, so this is a pro- issue that comes up in other work we've done. 
with tuberculosis prevention. Um, essentially, there's a health program that is being run and you want people to adhere to the health program. I'll, I'll describe the one uh, for this uh, work with an NGO called Arman that uh, does work with expecting and young mothers. The basic idea, so this is in India where, you know, the, the, there's the statistics of, um, you know, children uh, who are born, who may be uh, short, you know, who, who may not get high, full weight and so forth is all uh, very high. So basically you have um, a great need there to make sure that you deliver health messages to women in a timely fashion. So the way this uh, NGO does this work is that they issue a phone call three minutes in the voice of a friendly local neighborhood health worker to expecting moms who have registered with them uh, saying, you know, you are in the sixth week of pregnancy. This is what you should expect. You are in the, you know, this is, your, you know, your child is now two months old. Please register in this government program, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, there's a call that's given or two calls given every week. Uh, and they have shown in randomized control trials that women who listen to the information actually there's a significant improvement in their health and baby's health. Mm -hmm. The challenge they face is that women may become low listeners over time. They may drop off of the program, mm -hmm. which means that they will not benefit from the program. Where our work comes in is to be able to predict in advance which women are going to drop off of, out of the program or become low listeners so that the NGO can go to those women, give them a live call ahead of time or encourage them to stay in the program so that they, you know, they don't miss those calls. And we've built that software. We've shown that we're uh, more than 80% accurate in identifying these women ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we've deployed the software and you know, the NGO is using this information to all those women. <laughs> ahead of time and make sure that they don't drop off. Mm -hmm. So this is an actual system that we were able to show that we can show benefit in terms of real life application. Mm -hmm. um, but this also comes up in other areas uh, where, you know, there's adherence to medicine, you know, so people have to take their medicine every day. Uh, this happens, for example, for tuberculosis prevention. If we can predict in advance that you know, this person is going to drop off of their adherence and we can keep them engaged in the program. Mm -hmm. So these are, uh, these are just some of the things, but there are other things we've looked at. Human, preventing human wildlife conflict, for example, is another one. Um, I'm curious in this uh, social good domain, you, you mentioned just a couple of uh, adherence use cases. Is, is there more or less of an ability to um, to reuse, you know, innovation from one domain to another similar domain because of the, the human factors involved in, in the social good work? There is there are some core problems that seem to come up. You're right. So, for example, spreading information like we discussed in, in terms of social networks, that seems to be a problem that's common. Um, adherence problems, that's one of the, you know, uh, pr problems that's common. When it comes to, you know, wildlife conservation or, you know, the, these problems related to whether it's illegal poaching, illegal fishing, illegal uh, logging, I mean, there's, there's sort of a common problems related to crimes against the environment uh, in, in, in some ways. And so there are these broad classes of problems where there's some uh, carryover of techniques, although each domain may bring its own twist uh, to, to the problem. Mm -hmm. And in each case, one of the things that is common is that we really want to go from getting the data all the way to deploying things in the field. Because in our view, unless you actually show social impact, is not quite AI for social impact. You know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> that rings true. <laughs> Because writing a paper by itself, you know, it is, is not really AI for social impact. You know, it's, it's like you've written a paper, wonderful. I, and, and it's important to write uh, and uh, yeah. make contributions to science and, you know, AI and so forth. But if we say, if we label it as AI for social impact, then we want to see the social impact. Right. 
right? Does that mean that when we see people talking about AI for social good and not AI for social impact, we need to be, you know, particularly careful about that wording? <laughs> I, I mean, I started using the word social impact because I wanted to emphasize impact, but same thing for so AI for social good. I feel that You're doing good. You got to show, you got to actually see the good on the ground. Uh, if we just say it's AI for social good and a paper gets written, it's important to write those papers. It's important. But it's like job not fully done. We, we got to see the final output in terms of social impact or the actual out. Uh, you know, in our view, when we talk about AI for social impact, social impact has to be a first class citizen of this universe. It is not like, well, there's the AI, we published the AI, and then social impact, well, that's just the application and it's not that important. That's not the way we think about it. Yeah. Yeah, I talk to a lot of people who are uh, ML and AI practitioners or learners, and they, you know, broadly want to apply these newfound superpowers to, you know, affecting good in the world, um, but you know, aren't really sure where to start or how to start or you know, the accessing the data that they might use to solve a problem, you know, is, is challenging. Do you have any, uh, is that a question that you get? Do you have any tips or thoughts on, you know, how folks should approach uh, having an impact in this field? Uh, so my, uh, yes, indeed, that's a very important question that I get asked. And my answer is that you got to go to the problem and we can't, be in our ivory towers or wherever we are and just say, well, here's a solution. Wouldn't it be nice if I can find a problem that fits this solution? <laughs> so, you know, I learned about some kind of machine learning technique. Let me go find a problem. I think it's, in, in my view, go to the local nonprofits. Um, I mean, there's so many people doing absolutely inspiring work. And that's one of the things I find when I'm working in this. To be so inspired, you know, it's so inspiring to see these people uh, out in the field doing, I mean, really amazing amounts of volunteer work uh, or, you know, really just trying to make, in, uh, make uh, an impact. And so from them, if we can find out what is the problem where we could make a difference for them. Mm -hmm. And then try to give them the tool that would help them. That's the way I uh, I've approached things, and that's the way. I mean, for example, at our uh, center here at Harvard, the Center for Research on Computation in Society, the goal is to talk to the local area nonprofits, understand from them what problems there are, and then build tools for that. That's exactly the approach we've also taken with uh, Google Research India, with the AI for Social Good, is to bring in nonprofits, understand. And it's sometimes the case that, you know, people may say, well, we are a nonprofit, but we don't need AI. Uh, we need, you know, something else. And that's fine too. You know, it's an AI is not a shine, you know, it's, it's not gonna solve all problems. We understand, you know, it, it, it may not be a solution at all in some cases, but in some cases it is. And in some cases there is, you know, the NGOs are sitting on some data that's valuable to them. They don't have the resources to, actually themselves learn machine learning and, and, and apply those techniques. But they would love to understand, you know, would love to get our help. And that's where I find uh, that's the way to approach. So that's the advice I've given people mm -hmm. is, uh, is to find those uh, local nonprofits, um, you know, and then based on the needs that they have. And it may not succeed initially, but, you know, there they, they will be somebody who you will find who say, hey, I can, I can make, use of your talents and show, you know, have an impact on the world. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, Milan, it's been wonderful chatting with you about some of the work that you're up to. Any uh, parting thoughts for folks that are watching this? Thank you, first of all, for inviting me. Thank you. I had a lot of fun uh, talking to you. You know, really awesome questions. No, I think some of the points I just wanted to make, if you are interested in AI for social good, AI for social impact, this is work that requires us to step out of the lab. Clearly difficult in this time of the pandemic, but <laughs> something, you know, as uh, something that we have to do uh, in order and build those uh, interdisciplinary partnerships as we discussed. 
mm-hmm. and um, start from the problem rather than starting from a solution. Uh, I think those are things that I hope people will, but I hope people will get interested in this area. I hope this is an area that will thrive and something where we can actually bring AI to those who have not benefited from AI, which is perhaps the vast majority uh, of the population on, you know, uh, in the globe. Great. Great. Thanks so much, Melan. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. All right, that, all righty. So that interview is complete, but now we are live with Millen. Hello, how Millen, are you? great to reconnect with you. Super excited we were able to include that discussion as part of our Twimmel Fest festivities. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, I, and I really enjoyed the conversation uh, also in the comments box. Yeah, there's been a lot of great uh, conversation. And I thought we would start by maybe surfacing some of that for folks that uh, aren't participating in the chat or catch this afterwards. Uh, a lot of the conversations and questions revolved around some of the priorities that you're pursuing as part of AI for Social Good at Google. And um, uh, health and healthcare came up, water came up, maybe spend a few minutes talking about uh, some of that work and some of the use cases you mentioned in the chat. So the work we've, that we are doing in uh, Google Research India is uh, focused on public health and conservation. We started that work by pairing up uh, people from uh, nonprofits with academics. And so this was a workshop whereby we brought in the nonprofits, brought in academic researchers, and then we figured out how to do good teamwork, how to do good teaming of these uh, um, nonprofits with uh, uh, our colleagues and formed a team uh, where we are also a part of it. Public health, uh, there's a blog, and I've uh, put a, a link to the blog in the chat window, but um, there, you know, where we've listed these six projects, but they're in maternal and child care. Um, in trying to make sure we can understand the quality of the healthcare data, preventing HIV again uh, uh, in, in Bangalore. Uh, with, uh, I mean, all of this is work with the NGOs. Uh, there's work on preventing human wildlife conflict, and there's work um, in um, ensuring that proper amount of water gets set from the dam. Now, some of the work, as I said, is where we are directly involved. Some others are not profits working with academics where we have um, sort of facilitate the teaming and so forth. So these are some of the problems we're working on. In the future, we are going to start a number of uh, new projects. And so we are looking forward to that. Uh, it's a bit of an echo, but hopefully it's still here. Uh, uh, let's see if this helps with the echo. All right. Yeah, it uh, helps. Okay, great. Uh, so, um, Another question that came up and was a theme throughout some of the the conversation we had in the interview as well as via the chat is uh, regarding collaboration. And Chris uh, McRae, for example, mentioned that he's working to identify opportunities for Tata consultants to get involved in AI for social good causes. Uh, you know, how do you generally think about and pursue collaborations? Uh, so I guess, first of all, uh, for some of the bigger collaborations, certainly you can directly contact me um, uh, the, and my email. You know, if you just uh, Google my name, it should come up with my web page. I'll put, put that information. I put it in the chat window, but I'll, I'll do it again. Uh, and so that's one way to start. But as I said, one of the other ways, uh, at least um, in, in, in India, for example, we hope that uh, we will be able to have a, a request where, uh, for proposals or something like that in the future, whereby we will have um, people be able to contact us uh, through that request. So that's one other way. Uh, but it's a you know it's a, it's a very important problem whereby our goal remains uh, how to ensure that we can make these AI tools available on a much wider scale to nonprofits uh, around the goal uh, around the globe, and and not and in a way so that we aren't 
gatekeepers to this technology, that it is wide, widely available, uh, democratization of this technology. To, uh, right now, it's we are not there. We are just not there in terms of understanding of the problems that are faced by these nonprofits in a way where we can supply ready-made tools. Uh, but hopefully, that's what we will be heading towards. And then that will just make it easier for people to engage. Uh, with the local ANIA nonprofits in making sure that they work on problems that are relevant to their communities. Great question from Anupam. Are you seeing any applications of AI to education? Is, is that an area that you're working on? Uh, certainly. I mean, in, in India, for example, I mean, obviously, uh, as Anupam certainly may know, there's hundreds of languages, local languages. And so one of the challenges is to ensure that particularly for lower resource languages, uh, that children's books be available. Um, and uh, that's one of the projects that we are supporting is how can we help translate books from one language to another so that children have uh, culturally appropriate uh, books in their local language that are available in two languages. Uh, we were supporting in our last go around, our Konkani and Maithili were uh, these very low uh, among these low resource languages. But uh, that's something that we are very interested in, in terms of uh, supporting uh, local languages in terms of via machine translation and language models. So that's one of the areas. Um, it's not a major focus of my group, uh, although there are other researchers uh, at Google Research India who are focused uh, on this topic. But for AI for social good, we have, I mean, just because, I mean, there's all kinds of very, very interesting problems, but we just have to focus just because of resource limits. So public health, uh, agriculture, conservation, these are the problems we've just focused on just because uh, you, know, you have to have some focus, otherwise it's just difficult to have that kind of an impact. Those are all pretty big areas. Right. <laughs> so, uh, we are interested in education, but it's uh, somewhat, uh, you know, it's just, and also my training is not in uh, natural language understanding and things of that nature that would be relevant, particularly for uh, Indian language, machine translation, things of that nature. So it's harder for me to be really deeply engaged. So that's partly the decision. But as I said, there are other research groups. Uh, in the lab who are focused on machine translation and so on. So they would obviously be very keen on working with uh, AI for education. And they are. Got it. Um, one of the questions that came up was relating to the idea of um, uh, deep fakes and fighting misinformation. And you connected it to some of the social network uh, work that you've done and that we talked about in the interview. Can you elaborate on, on that use case? So I guess the idea is that uh, we've worked on spreading information ab uh, about HIV prevention, for example, in a social network. But one could imagine that there is a, a um, you know, campaign whereby some one party is spreading misinformation and the, we have to counter it uh, by spreading our own information, correct information to neutralize this misinformation being spread. So you can imagine that this is like a um, conflict between two sets of messages going across. In the commercial space, this is like two companies you know, uh, going at each other with, try, with respect to viral marketing and trying to spread their product ahead of others. But in the information space where we are talking about public health information, whether it's like, a, a, you know, anti-vaccine kind of information spreading in a social network, we want to combat it by spreading the right kind of information. So we've done some uh, work in this context of trying to, you know, how do you effectively spread counter messages by choosing the correct kind of influencers to counter the influencers that were chosen by the other side in order to spread our uh, uh, information. But we haven't really, I mean, this is one of those uh, papers that we have uh, you know, explored. It's not something that we've actually deployed in practice or have tried out in practice and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, the, the, all, you know, we have to be a little bit careful about uh, how to actually engage in these things. But yeah, I mean, uh, this is um, this kinds of uh, trying to combat fake news, trying to, especially as it relates to important public health concerns. Um, is, is important to make sure that uh, the correct information goes out. 
And Benedict is asking about the, you know, when you layer on um, low resource language uh, issue on top of fighting fake news, are there any thoughts on how those intersect? Oh, it's, uh, I mean, some of these are such wonderful research challenges that are coming up in the chat window. I, I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's really a, a terrific job. Thank you, uh, listeners, and, and you know, uh, for people who are in the chat window. Really amazing. I mean, these are all really interesting challenges. I'm not personally aware of. Uh, Milan is or... not doing everything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it's a, it's a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, issue to be looking at. Uh, yeah, I mean, especially, I mean, you know, it, we have to sort of think about how we can ensure that we don't lose a part of our human heritage, uh, lose these languages. I mean, I, I, my own mother tongue is Marathi. And, you know, I mean, there's so, such rich, rich, rich literature, such rich culture. And, um, you know, how do we ensure that uh, all of this is preserved for future generations? And not only, I mean, that's just one language. There's thousands of languages, but there's, a, there's sort of a continuous assault just because of the way the world is structured on uh, these languages. Uh, and so how do we ensure that... Uh, you know, these languages are preserved. They sort of, I mean, that's one of the more major, I guess that's one of the major languages, but there are obviously languages that are much lower resource languages where uh, this is a real threat. And so we, I mean, I'm personally very keen and figuring out ways to collaborate on that would be something very interesting for me to pursue. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you can comment on how you generally think of the role of AI for social good you know, in business. So you, you're doing this, you know, for Google, a, a commercial organization. I think it was since we spoke, the head of Coinbase came out and said, hey, Coinbase is a kind of politics and cause neutral company. Keep your keep your causes at home employees. They lost like some 60 employees as a result of that. Uh, good for them, but you know clearly there's at least one company that thinks that you know these kinds of causes don't have any place in you know in the business setting. How do you think about that? Well, I I mean uh, you know you you hit the nail on the head. I mean if if uh, we are passionate about uh, you know certain causes around the globe and we have you know this sort of superpower as you mentioned. <laughs> of uh, AI that, uh, I mean, obviously, collectively through everybody's efforts. And it is important that we don't keep it confined to uh, sort of the 1% of the planet that has access. Uh, I mean, there's billions of people who are in poverty uh, and, you know, have such a major, such major challenges that it is important to figure out how we can benefit. And it's in the self-interest of uh, People, I mean, if these people start doing well, I assume they'll join the join place where they can uh, start buying things and things of that nature. So it's probably also a good thing from that uh, self-interest perspective. <laughs> but more importantly, I mean, it's just a, a cause that is important. I mean, I that's what I've uh, been pushing, whether in my academic life or as a part of um, as being head of Google Research India. And I'm fortunate that in um, at least in the organization that I'm part of, that they have been, you know, they have been very enthusiastic in their support. Um, this uh, is something that we are growing uh, in in Bangalore, and so yeah, I mean, it's it's important. I mean, it's I mean, and I see that uh, many others are involved with this um, with the AI for social good. So it's not just uh, you know just one company. It seems like this is an effort that's gaining widespread support. We just see a larger field being grown together just by, I think, a common understanding that AI for social good is an important uh, activity for all to participate in. And it's such a, you know, I mean, for people who are um, engaged in AI research, I mean, it's something that, you know, they can really contribute to. So thank you uh, for, for that. Absolutely. And we're going to get in one final question from Anupam about um, HIV prevalence in Bangalore. Is that something your your project was based in the L.A. area? Have you also been involved in work in India? 
Yeah, so the project that we've been involved in um, in a major way was in Los Angeles. Uh, that's where we did a larger scale study with uh, 700 youth experiencing homelessness and uh, the results of that study are available. The one in Bangalore is uh, work done with an, uh, you know, inspire all of these nonprofits are so inspiring, uh, nonprofit called Swasti. And so we are collaborating uh, with the academic institution, Triple IT Delhi, and with uh, uh, this nonprofit in order to do HIV prevention in, in Bangalore. So as far as the results, this is uh, in initial stages. Um, so we don't have, um, we have some initial sort of uh, preliminary result. We, we don't have uh, the kind of long term because the one in Los Angeles has been going on since 2013. So it took five, six years for that project to come to the point that it came to here. We have just begun. So it's a little bit early for us to have actual research. But yes, we are focused on that. And, and maybe to generalize the, the question a little bit, you, you, you come in with these tools, superpowers, you develop models, they, you know, hopefully demonstrate some utility. What are the main ways that you transfer this back to the field workers in the case of Final Pump's question or the agencies? Is it primarily through writing academic research papers or are you, do you help the agencies build tools? Is it more of a traditional knowledge transfer, PowerPoint slides, that kind of thing, all of the above? All of the above, but most importantly, we actually want to give them that software that you know, so that it can be actually used. So this, the burden is not on them to absorb the technical material and then uh, try and figure out how to go about solving the problem. But for example, for wildlife conservation, the POS software that predicts where poachers set traps or snitch, we are actually trying to move that software and make it available to hundreds of national parks around the globe with the help of a, a smart uh, partnership, which is a, a combination of WWF, WCS, and 13 other organizations. So we're with their collab with their collaboration and blessing just making that software available to everybody uh you know also rangers can just download and start using that software so the goal is really to transition the software uh, that we built for actual use and this is very important to us because it is important that we actually see the social impact it's beneficial to see what problems it brings up so we can do better research <laughs> And, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it sort of often leads to new research problems also. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, very important for us. And it's a very important question how to ensure that that transition does happen. Because without that, uh, you know, we wouldn't have real social impact. So AI for social impact, in my mind, it is very important to think through how we are going to sustain these projects with the nonprofits in the long run. And does it make sense to ask how much of the benefit of these projects is you know, software that can use these models to, you know, help folks do their, their jobs better or, or, you know, work in their their local areas better versus, you know, how often is it, you know, as part of developing the model and maybe, you know, understanding what the model is doing, do we gain fundamental insights around, you know, the behavior of a, a system that someone is trying to work in? I think your you you uh, right that we actually view this sort of uh, trying to push for AI for social impact and advancing AI research as things that go hand in hand. And often there are new problems that are thrown up by the trying to push for the social impact that had we not actually tried to do the implementation, we would have not thought of. And so fundamental new problems come up uh, as a result of AI for social impact. So I really think it's... Um, <laughs> You know, those things go hand in hand, and uh, it's important uh, that we push both. And the kinds of problems that come up perhaps are more important for AI for social impact, but but these fundamental problems are, uh, I mean, yes, there are actual fundamental contributions that come up. And so the publications we do end up going to the AI conferences, you know, AAA, IHK, NURIPS, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's both go hand in hand, and it's important yeah. for us to do so. Great. Well, Milan, thanks so much for uh, joining me once again and for uh, answering all these questions. Thanks, everyone in the audience for your questions. They were wonderful. And uh, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of this week at Twimmelfest. And uh, be sure once again to check out the agenda and uh, catch all of the new sessions we've added.